Hi, it's James and Watts. Welcome back to my YouTube channel. <laughs> so funny to even be saying that, but it is what it is. I became a YouTuber girly a couple months ago and I am enjoying it. So I'm back at you with episode three of my YouTube show where I talk about mostly knitting, but also my life. Um, Welcome back to returning viewers. Welcome to the first time for my new viewers. And yeah, let's do this. Let's get into it. Um, thanks as always for all the love on my previous videos. I love going through the comments and seeing what you guys say. But the one thing that I really found remarkable, so I will be remarking on it, is that I've seen a handful of comments from viewers who are letting me know that they are not even knitters or part of the yarn world and they're just finding me on YouTube and like watching me talk about knitting. <laughs> That's kind of unbelievable to me. Uh, why are you here? But also thank you. Please stay, enjoy. That is really, really sweet that like I'm already roasting from week month to month when I make these videos I'm making fun of all the knitters who are dorky enough to want to watch me talk about knitting for an hour plus but that is just unbelievable that even non-knitters are finding themselves here but like I said it's really sweet and I appreciate it and I love if you find this cozy or just have it on in the background and half ignore me whatever you do um, it's really appreciated and it's really sweet. I know I love, I'm like really trying to get more into YouTube as a viewer these days and like find uh, new channels that I appreciate and stuff, knitting and non-knitting, like lifestyle, but a lot of what I like is a little bit slower, uh, slightly boring. I like to have something on in the background. I like to, if it's a really long video, especially like a knitting podcast, I take advantage of those speed tools and I will put on, depends on like the pace at which the person in the video speaks, but I will usually put it on like 1.5 times speed, if not even a little bit more, two times if I'm in a hurry. Um, feel free to do that, oh my gosh. A long time to sit and watch a video maybe you want it to go by a little more quickly but i also feel like i'm speaking quickly today and i can be a real slow talker at times and my pace may change we'll see anyway today i have my notes on my ipad um and uh that's new but i like the idea of using my ipad for the notes Ew, the case is so ugly. Don't look at the case. I've had it since I've had the iPad and I got this iPad many years ago. It's just a regular iPad. It's not like a Pro or something. I would like an iPad Pro if anyone wants to give me one, Apple. But using an iPad, I feel like the main demographics of iPad users are grandparents, like old people and babies. Toddlers and ancient people love iPads, and so do I. So I'm somewhere in the middle, but I like my iPad. I really feel like a grandpa when I like use my iPad to text or take a photo, but I rarely do that. But it is so funny to hold up a whole iPad to take a photo of something. Do y'all know what I mean? That is a total like 80 year old behavior. There's nothing wrong with that. I'm not roasting 80 year olds. It's just the truth, okay? Don't get mad. Um, oh, I got my hair cut today and I'm super happy with it. I mean, it's really severe. I think I'll like it even more after I give it another uh, couple days because I just washed it this morning and I wash my hair like once a week, not frequently. And it lets it get nice and curly in the meantime. So it's not super curly yet, but I've been uh, growing out the mullet since November 2021, I think is when I started and when I first got rid of my bowl cut, which for those of you who've known me for a few years, I wore a bowl cut for years. I was very ahead of the game. I was early on the trend for the bowl cut, okay? 
And I love that hair. And it took a lot of thinking and convincing myself to move on from the bowl cut because it was also emblematic of my brands and identity, okay? Like, even if I never wore a bowl cut again, I think it's a piece of my core. And for those who know me, like, they will associate that hairstyle with me. But this kind of gets me back into the bowl cut game while keeping the mullet. And that was my inspiration. I've been thinking about getting a haircut for a few weeks and I knew I wanted to change it up. I knew I wanted to get a little bit of the length off the top, which scares me, scared me, because I am balding. My hair is getting so thin. You can really like see my scalp. I mean, it's probably not too bad now because it's really fresh and filled with like kind of volumizing powder and product and stuff. But generally that's the truth of it is that my hair is thinning and uh, I don't know what to do about it at the moment. I mean, it's not that bad, so I'm just not doing anything. But um, I was taking finasteride, which is a prescription. My iPad is blinding me, I'm turning it off. Stop. Which is a prescription pill for men daily that you can take to help uh, prevent further or even reverse male pattern baldness. And I was on it for a few months and I ran out and it's i don't have any insurance in croatia overall like basic medicines are just much more affordable here like i've had to buy antibiotics and they were like you know without insurance they were like five bucks or something other other like normal medicines i've bought have been really cheap too but when i tried to replace my finasteride for my hair regrowth it was going to be pretty expensive for something that i was going to be needing to buy every month and i just decided to get off of it and I feel like I've noticed a little bit of thinning continuing to happen once I have been off the finasteride. And that's okay. I don't know how much I really wanted to be on a, a daily pill that it, it, it works by like blocking certain androgen hormones, right? And I don't know how much I wanted to be on a pill that affects your hormones for the rest of my life. And like when I got on it, my dermatologist gave me a big warning about how it can uh, affect your <laughs> like your sex drive and your libido and your it can make you impotent. OK, um, and when my dermatologist told me that he was being so serious and I was like, well, there's a pill for that, too, if it comes to that, which I thought was really funny. And he, he shrugged it off and I didn't see any. Uh, noticeable effects in that department um, but maybe there were some that were so small that I couldn't tell like oh my god I don't even want a 1% decrease in my virility okay I'm a young buck all right <laughs> okay I'm gonna move on from this topic because it's too stupid and embarrassing okay um, but yeah, I love my haircut. It's so, I told the, the barber exactly what I wanted and I was like, I want it severe. He was like, you want it round here? And I was like, no, give me a corner, like a straight edge, like a square. Uh, but I'm really happy with it. It's super fun. Ugh, my iPad. Okay, uh, what else do I want to mention? I want to give a little tidbit, some insight, uh, into my life here in Croatia. If you're new here or don't really know me, I'm living in Croatia at the moment as a digital nomad, as a self-employed person. Uh, I ended up here because one of my old best friends is Croatian and it's really as simple as that. And from episode to episode, I'm thinking about what I can share about life here. And what I would like to share today is that people in Croatia are fucking tall, okay? They are so tall. It's ridiculous. Like, I am, I'm somewhere in the neighborhood of 5'9 and 5'10. I don't know. I, I found out I had scoliosis last year, so I'm probably shrinking. I'm probably closer to 5'9 now than I was 5'10 even two years ago, okay? Because I have a curved spine that no one ever told me about until I was like 20, 28, probably, was when I figured that out. Anyway. That's it really, is that Croatians are tall, but like, 
It's ridiculous, okay? I, I tell you my height because that's, in America, that is such an average male height. Like, everyone's that tall. And, like, you meet tall people in America, in my experience, you meet tall men, and they're, like, six, six feet tall. And you're like, ooh, he's tall. He's six feet tall. Six feet tall is so average here. And it really, like... It is really not uncommon when I leave the house, like almost every time I leave the house, I will pass by a man who is an entire head taller than me. The top of my head goes up to like his neck and shoulders and I'm like, what the hell? That is too freaking tall. I've never felt so short as I did here. There are also plenty of women who are my height and taller here, much more than what I'm used to. Um, and I'm just the type of person, especially when it comes to uh, other men, I anyone who is shorter than me is a tiny little itty bitty baby short king, even if they're like half an inch shorter than me. <laughs> and anyone who's taller than me is a freak of nature and is too, too big and too tall, okay? But that's just how I am, okay? I'm Goldilocks, I'm the standard, I'm the blueprint. Anyway, I'm gonna move on. <laughs> That's my Croatian tidbit. Um, something else I'll share a little bit about after a sip of my iced coffee. Is I just wanted to talk coffee a bit. Um, so I did not like really get heavily into coffee until past my, past the age of 25, I would think. Like maybe when I started my master's in Florida, which was around the age of, I don't know, 26 or 27, I started drinking coffee every day for the first time then. And, and then once I moved into my own apartment a year into living in Florida, I like found what worked for me and how I like to have coffee because I didn't want to go out for coffee every day. Um, and that was to do a pour over on a V60, um, which is like, I get the one from Hario, which is a brand, H-A-R-I-O. It's a Japanese brand of mostly of coffee stuff, I think, but also like other types of vessels, cups, mugs, tea sets, things like that. Um, the V60 is just a cone shaped implement and they make plastic, ceramic, they even make beautiful copper ones. I have the ceramic one, which I feel like is the standard it's pretty inexpensive too but you take they make different sizes i got the one that was good for me to make about a single mug of coffee you could make more or less in, in a v60 you don't have to make the exact same quantity but anyway i found that the pour over really worked for me um and i was even for the first time in my life starting to enjoy black coffee um I always like to put dairy in my coffee. Um, I'm not too big into putting sugar, but I was finally getting a taste for black coffee. And then I came to Croatia and I kind of assumed I would just get a, I didn't bring any coffee stuff, but I was like, I'm sure I can find a pour over cone and I'll just keep making pour over coffee. And I did find some shops that sell a pour over cone, but in general, um, that, those types of like brew methods, like American like drip coffee, French press, pour overs, they're not huge here and they're considered to be more specialty. Um, also in America, I had a pretty decent Burr coffee grinder. Uh, I don't even remember the brand. I wanna say it was Bialetti, but I feel like that's something else. I feel like I'm, Bialetti is the, the person who makes the mocha pot, so. And I also want to say it's burrata, but that's cheese. So I don't know. Anyway, I had a decent grinder to have fresh ground coffee every day for my pour over. But coming here, I kind of decided, I was like, I don't want to buy a grinder. Um, I am particular, like if I'm making a pour over, I want the right size coffee gr grounds for a pour over, which is like about around table salt, maybe a little thicker than that. Um, and... I didn't want to buy a grinder and you don't find coffees in the store that say that they are ground for the size of a pour over. Um, so if I really wanted to do it and do it right, I'd probably have to like go to specialty coffee shops and like get special products, which I didn't want to deal with that. I wanted it to be easier. And the main 
at home coffee brew method here is super traditional. It is use an implement called here. It's called Jezba. People all over the world make coffee like this, like Turkish coffee or even like Greek coffee. I think they use this method too, but it is super simple. It is a little metal pot that goes directly on the stove with a handle where you boil water and put super finely ground coffee. It's like powder consistency. It's more finely ground than espresso. And you just boil that coffee in the water and then pour it into cups. So it's like a really dirty kind of cup of coffee. You're actually ingesting a lot of coffee. It's not going through a filter to catch all of the coffee particles. And making coffee with Jezba is like beautiful and romantic and traditional and it's used all around the world, but it's just not my favorite cup of coffee. Uh, I will gladly have a Turkish coffee like that at a friend's house and that's pretty common if I'm uh, gonna have coffee at someone's home here that is what most people do and yeah I anyway I'm talking too much about coffee all this to say that I have landed on a mocha pot which is something I always wanted to try uh, some people call it like stovetop espresso. It's not espresso, but it's, it's similar. It's more similar to espresso than other brew methods. Um, and it does have a pressurized uh, aspect to the way it brews. So um, yeah, I'm enjoying being a mocha pot girly. Mocha pot is pretty common here as well for home coffee brewing. So you can find at any grocery store pre-ground coffee that is ground specifically to be brewed in a mocha pot. And I got a beautiful Bialetti, is that what I was saying? The, the main brand that makes those mocha pots. I got a beautiful blue enameled one. And a few weeks ago, I was making coffee and completely forgot about it. And I let all the coffee burn out, all the liquid burnt out of that thing. And it just sat there on the stove scorching for 45 minutes. I totally ruined it and ended up throwing it away which is a shame. That name brand is like, it was expensive. It was like 30 euros to get the nice brand with the nice color. You don't need to spend that much on a mocha pot. You don't need the name brand. They all do the same thing. But I ended up, uh, I was telling my friend Anna about what happened and she just, they had a mocha pot laying around at her family's house that no one uses. They, they use Jezva to make Turkish coffee. So she was like, you can take our mocha pot. Like, I don't even know why we have this. We've never used it. And it's a little bit bigger than the one I had. With mocha pots, unlike the pour over coffee, they both come in different sizes, the pour over cones and the mocha pots. Um, but with a mocha pot, you need to make the full pot of coffee if you want it to brew correctly, to my understanding. Um, there's like a line you need to fill up with water. It needs to reach that line. And then there's a little gasket or basket or whatever um, that holds the ground coffee that needs to be filled up and leveled to the top. So I uh, have been making like a lot more coffee than what I really want, what I'm used to. And I don't let, wanna let it go to waste. So what I've been doing is having a hot coffee in the morning and then I let the pot sit there for a few hours and when I want another boost and it's cold, I pour it over ice to have an iced coffee. So it's like 7 p.m. and I am having iced coffee. I hope I don't regret that. Um, normally I have my second coffee a little bit earlier in the day, but yeah, so that's that on that about coffee and where I'm at in my mocha pot journey. Um, if you're bored, sorry, not sorry. Okay. Uh, I went to Vienna, as I mentioned in my last, my last episode, I think was right before I was going to go to Vienna and now I've had that trip. It was really fun. I went with my bestie Anna primarily so that we could go see Joe Hisaishi's uh, symphony concert there and that is the composer of Hayao Miyazaki's film scores for Studio Ghibli among other films and directors. Um, but he did some original non-cinematic music and then he did uh, the main like famous piece on that concert was the suite from uh, Princess Mononoke, which was gorgeous. The whole concert was really stunning. Um, he conducted, he played piano, he gave an encore um, 
and played the most famous theme from Spirited Away. I think it's called One Summer's Day. And I was crying. I was sitting there like silently <laughs> shaking. My body was shaking and I was crying and sniffling. I think a lot of people in the audience were really moved. Uh, he's just a brilliant composer and I know I and many other fans of Hayao Miyazaki's anime films are very connected to those those films. I grew up with them. They're super nostalgic to me. They were formative to me. Um, and it, they are some of the only movies that I rewatch really regularly. Like every year I'm rewatching a handful of those films. Um, so that was just a beautiful experience. Thank you to anyone who gave recommendations of what to do in Vienna. I did like go through on my comments and on my uh, Instagram. I did a little uh, story asking for recommendations and like looked at everything everyone said and ended up going to some of the places. I'm not even going to get into everywhere I went. It was, you, there is so much to do in Vienna and we just scratched the surface being there like four or five days, but everything was really beautiful, super enjoyable. Everything in Vienna is so fancy. Like just your average building on the street is like so like Baroque looking. It's intense. It's so beautiful. It's so highly decorated and fancy. All the like interiors of places we were visiting um, were like gilded in gold, beautiful museums, beautiful concert halls. Uh, I, I loved, I loved Vienna and I would recommend it to anyone who likes to visit a city like that. Uh, my friend Anna put it well when she said that you can tell it's, it was like a former empire that you're visiting just with the amount of resources and wealth that have been there historically. Um, that was, that was a nice trip. Um, you know, I, I will give one specific recommendation because it would be really easy to skip over this um, at Schönbrunn Palace which anyone who's doing a touristy trip to, Schön, to Vienna would probably know about and visit Schönbrunn, Schönbrunn Palace um, it's like one of the first things that'll come up if you like look up things to do in Vienna it's just this old ancient beautiful baroque palace it's super nice you go take a tour there but specifically because the grounds there are huge and beyond the, the palace which there's a couple of different versions of the main palace tour you can take like whatever do what you want i think we took the grand tour or like imperial tour or something whichever is like the big tour you could do of the main residence we took that one and it was really nice but then on the grounds, there's all sorts of like extra things. Like there's a zoo, there's different gardens that are ticketed, there's different structures that are ticketed. And we did not do everything. That would be too much, it would be all day. But we did do the Palm House or Palmen House, um, which was a greenhouse filled with palms and like orchids and ferns and like rainforest vibes. That was super cool. I love a greenhouse generally and I really love in an old like European city a really like ancient greenhouse that's grand and like just has a beautiful patina on all of the parts uh, that was really beautiful and we got some really nice pictures there I have one I could show actually I'll just show it now also I because I'm not willing to edit these videos that would like kill it for me um, I have a new innovation for this week, which is <laughs> I put pictures that I want to show on my iPad that I'll just hold up. But here is me wearing this sweater in the Palm House on a, a film photograph. But yeah, that was Vienna. Um, okay, I'm finally ready. I feel like I've been talking for half an hour already easily. I don't know, but I'm ready to talk about knitting. Maybe I'll actually like put a timestamp in the video that's like, here's where knitting talk begins, but probably not, honestly. If you really don't want to hear me talk about all these other extremely interesting things, then I'm not going to blame you, but I'm also not going to aid and assist you in skipping my thoughtfully prepared and delivered content, okay? So you can skip around yourself in this video. <laughs> um, 
Oh my God, I'm mean like, with a bad attitude. Why do y'all like me? So I wanna thank everyone who supported my last release in March of Best Vest. I was really happy with that pattern, with that design, with that release. Everything went really well. The tester versions were beautiful. I think already a couple of people who purchased the pattern have completed knitting it and it's a beautiful, simple vest. Um, it's great. So thank you uh, for those who commented nice things about it on YouTube, on Instagram, people who bought it on my Ravelry or my PayHip. That is really appreciated. It's super sweet. When I made my Instagram post about that vest, I, I don't know, sometimes I'm just feeling, feeling silly and goofy. Um, sorry, my Texas accent just came out when I said filling. I was filling. Sometimes I'm filling. Feeling. <laughs> I sound like, oh my God, you know who really does that with that vowel is Whitney Rose from Real Housewives of Salt Lake City for any of my Bravo fans who are watching. She always says, but like, that's how I feel. How do you feel? That's, I'm, those are my feelings. Um, but I definitely think that, I don't know what her accent is, but I think that is, a little bit of a southern thing for, for me. Um, anyway, sometimes I'm feeling silly and goofy when I do a post on Instagram about a pattern release and in general, in life, in my business and knitting, I don't like to take anything too, too seriously. I think we should all be light and have fun whenever it's appropriate. And I, put something in the caption about the construction. And I was like, here's what you're gonna do. Like, it's so simple. You are gonna cast on, it's bottom up. You're gonna cast on your stitches for the waistband and then you're going to enjoy knitting one by one ribbing for four inches. And then I said something like, it's a privilege to purl and you're gonna enjoy like all the stitches or whatever. And people really grabbed onto that line and thought it was super funny, but also were like kind of taking it seriously and being like, you know what? You're right. I just needed a mental shift on how I view ribbing and how I view purling. And I put that there as a joke. And really, because I know so many knitters don't like knitting ribbing for inches and inches and don't like having to purl tons and tons. Um, so I put that in there to to poke at that and make it a joke and to also to sell my pattern and sublimin sub subliminally be like, you like to pearl and you wanna knit this vest because you can't wait to knit the ribbing, ha ha ha. But as silly and goofy as it is, it is a privilege to pearl, okay? Like, I understand like we don't all love every technique equally blah, 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 but knitting is beautiful and I genuinely enjoy every step of the process. I like caking up my yarn. I like knitting a gauge swatch. I like blocking. I like casting on. I love ribbing. I could knit ribbing all day. I love purling. I love knitting. I love knitting lace. I love seaming. I enjoy weaving in my ends and making sure I'm happy with all the finishings. Um, sorry to be like a teacher's pet and like an A plus student to knitting, but I really do think it is a mentality that like all of those things are important. All of those things go into the finished product and they all matter. And uh, if you base, I think the main reason people don't like purling as much as knitting is because it's a little bit slower than knitting for most knitters, right? Of course, there are some people who are faster purlers, people who do like, a, what is it, Portuguese knitting and stuff where it's around your neck and whatever, that's great. But I think for most of us, purling is a little bit more slow and let's not base our enjoyment of knitting on how quickly we can accomplish a certain technique. Okay, sorry to lecture you, but enjoy every juicy moment of your knit. I understand, like I've definitely been super impatient to get something done before, um, but overall, let's 
let's remember it's a privilege to pearl and go get best best and enjoy four inches of ribbing it's it's nice to me to have a rhythm of something where there's a little bit of motion actually stockinette can be a, a real slog uh, if it's just stuck in it around the whole time and you're just knitting, it's so easy to just keep putting it down because you can pick it up at any point and you won't be lost or confused. It's just stuck in it. So in a way, having other things to do is actually faster. All that to say, all that being said, I still don't love cabling. Cabling slows me down too much, but I also don't have that much experience cabling. Did my camera just slide down? Oh my gosh. I really hope my head is not cut out of this. Cause I swear I just saw the little pole on my tripod like go down a little bit. And I'll be sad if this whole video is like bad framing. Okay, my head is here. It's right there, like. Okay, I think we're still good, but I'm gonna... Just in case. That maybe was an optical illusion. Maybe there was nothing, but I swear I saw it move downward. Anyway, yeah, I am still a cable hater, but I bet if I did a bunch of cabling, I would find my rhythm, I'd get better at it, and I would learn to really enjoy it, just like I enjoy all other techniques, okay? So yeah, love your knitting. Knit your swatch, enjoy knitting your swatch. Um, let's talk about what I'm wearing. Uh, I'm wearing my dappled lace raglan in Ritual Dyes Undine, which is a uh, cotton linen blend. And the colorway I think is rye, like, like rye bread, R-Y-E. I think. And I just can't even tell you how happy I am with this sweater. I love it so much. I don't remember the last time I've been so excited to wear something I made. I feel, I love the way it fits me. I love the way the yarn feels on my body. I love the way the lace motif looks. It's super simple, but super, it's simple to knit, but it looks fancy in the fabric. It's very like dainty and frilly and lovely um, while still having somewhat of a simple motif, uh, appearance. It's not like a huge motif or something. But um, let me just give you a little bit of a view. Here's the back. Here's the other side. And yeah, I have nothing but good things to say about this. It, it really has made me happy. Um, it's still a bit cold to wear this. I'm actually a little bit cold in my apartment wearing this, but soon I'll be able to wear this every day if I want. And yeah, it's just so satisfying. I love all my designs, but it's really satisfying to be so excited to wear my own design. Um, and also the tester versions that I'm seeing overall are just excellent. I love the way it's fitting on everyone. I love the different yarn choices people have made. Um, I really do love it in Undine. Undine's a great yarn from Ritual Dyes and it is, um, it's well-priced. It's kind of in the middle there. I, I don't remember the exact price, but I want to say it's between like, I feel like it's around $15 a skein, something like that. Maybe even a little less. I don't know. Don't quote me on that. Um, so it's not like, you know, it's not like dirt cheap, like craft store yarn, but it is coming from a more like small business indie brand. Um, it's sort of a more like artisan product, right? And I feel like a lot of us are used to paying for a lot of hand dyed wools, um, upwards of $30 for a 100 gram skein. Sometimes $30 for a 50 gram skein, right? Um, which really adds up and can be quite cost prohibitive when you need a garment's worth of something. So, um, 
good price on this, but of course not everyone's, this would still be cost, cost prohibitive to many people without a doubt. And um, there's tons of great alternatives you could use as well. Actually, that's a good thought that I, I'm gonna take some time to think about what I wanna recommend also for um, more accessible yarns people could choose for this. Um, but yeah, very happy with this yarn. It's super nice, high quality, just barely tonal, but mostly uh, pretty even with the color. Um, the main concept and version of this pattern is short sleeved. I just, and cropped actually, I just decided to make mine uh, full body and full sleeve and I'm so happy with that. It, it really suits my style at the moment and I find it super elegant. And um, what else was I gonna say about this? I've done, I did the version without the shaping. So like sometimes when I'm wearing it, this ribbing here can bunch up a little bit. It doesn't bother me that much. And if I just give it a tug down, I get a good 30 minutes of wear with this beautiful neckline. And I don't mind just going like that every once in a while, it doesn't bother me. Um, I definitely wanted to knit both versions because this pattern has the version with shaping and without. Um, but yeah, sometimes on a sweater that doesn't have any shaping, it can really like choke you. Uh, I don't think this does that. And the main thing, if you are knitting a sweater, uh, like a raglan, top down raglan sweater that does not have the neck and shoulder shaping, um, just keep keep your cast on really loose for the neck because you can always put on some addition of ribbing or I-cord or even just cast on, knit one row and bind off however tight with whatever stitch count you want if you want to tighten your neck, but you cannot make a tight cast on looser, right? So that's my advice. Um, I, I always keep my, my cast ons for this type of garment super loose. And I went with ribbing. Um, my other sample that my friend Anna modeled for me has, um, no edgings, all raw edgings, which I love that look. You do need to be very, you got to get that good, good tension that I talked about in my last episode for your cast ons and your bind offs. Otherwise it will look sloppy or too tight or too loose and it'll roll, right? It, it's lace. So lace you have a very good chance starting right off the bat of it not rolling, unlike stockinette, which like is gonna roll uh, pretty much however you knit it. Um, lace wants to be flat, but even lace, if it's like a certain tension and then your bind off is just super loose, it's gonna, there's gonna be too much fabric at that edge and it'll flounce and flip and turn. So um, there's nothing wrong with that. And like, again, you can always redo that bind off. If you really want to have no edgings, you can redo your bind off. You can't redo your cast on, sorry, but you can redo your bind offs, which is three of the edges, right? Your sleeves and your waist. Um, but you can also just do an uh, applied I cord bind off, um, which tension can be tricky for that, but you just got to get it right and it'll look neat and clean and beautiful or ribbing. And I did ribbing on all my edges on this, and I kind of love, actually, like on a yarn like this, this cotton linen, uh, the ribbing has a tendency to sort of, it's not the neatest looking ribbing. It, it doesn't behave the same way that wool does in ribbing, but I sort of love what it's doing here. I love the way it's sort of just like stretched open, and I don't know, it does something for me. I enjoy it. But yeah, the main version of the pattern has no edgings, but ribbing and eye cords are good options and there's notes in the pattern about how to do those. Um, there isn't yet, but I will be adding just some general notes and thoughts uh, about how to, to do a nice long sleeve if you wanna do a long sleeve. But the main part of doing a long sleeve is self-explanatory. You knit the sleeve longer and you know, but I'll put more information than that. Um, yeah, let me let me show um, some of the pictures as a preview because I generally don't post any of my really nice pictures on Instagram until um, 
until the like release day. Um, but I enjoy using this little YouTube space as our own secret club where I, it's between me and my YouTube viewers only, where I will show things in advance. Um, so this might even be the cover image of the pattern. There's one other in a similar pose. But you can see the way my beautiful friend Anna's sweater is sitting on her. She she has the more like an initial original version of this this design with um, neat neat uh, raw edges on on her sweater and short sleeves. Um, here's another look. Also, I have no idea how this is looking for you, for me to show you photos on my iPad. I know taking videos of another electronic screen can sometimes end up super wonky. So if this just looks like trash, I won't do it in the future. Um, and we just won't have pictures. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's Dappled Lace Raglan. It'll come out this Friday, April 21st the day before my birthday, and I will be running a birthday sale, which I've been doing the past few years for the weekend. So Friday, Saturday, Sunday, uh, all of my patterns will be 22% off for my birthday, which is on April 22nd, which is also Earth Day, okay? I've always kind of been bitter about sharing my birthday with another holiday, a holiday that I have to share with the entire Earth. But I don't care anymore. I just, I'll use it in a girl boss like manner and be like, you love the earth? Then you'll love saving 22% on my knitting patterns, right? Um, yeah, okay. <laughs> What's next? I feel like this is gonna be an even longer episode than my last, and that is the trend that these episodes are getting longer and longer and longer. Um, I don't know how I feel about that. For now, I'll say that I feel indifferent. And like I said, it's up to you. Watch as much or as little as you want. Skip around, play with the speed settings on the video. Um, knock yourself out. Okay. Uh, for the birthday sale, usually yeah, there's a code for it. So keep an eye on my Instagram. I don't know what that code will be yet, but it'll be on my Instagram post releasing this pattern and announcing the sale. For those of you who are maybe just finding me for the first time on YouTube and you're not that familiar with me, I'm a knitwear designer and my Instagram is at James N. Watts, W-A-T-T-S, okay? Just like, I think that's my handle on YouTube too. Um, and I have a link in my bio where you can find my patterns and stuff. Um, but yeah, if you're not already on my Instagram, please go follow my Instagram. Please, let's blow me up. All right. Um, ugh. Last thing about this, I love this so much that I ordered yarn to knit myself a second one, which I never do. I've been so like motivated the past few years to keep designing and always, because knitting is just, it's so time consuming. It's really difficult to have, you know, a huge output all the time. Um, so even to keep up with like a more medium pace for design releases and scheduling, I kind of always need to be working on a few things, be working far in advance, but I love this sweater so much and I love knitting it that I've ordered myself yarn to make another and who knows, maybe I'll get the yarn and we'll be too distracted by future designs and just won't get around to it for a long time or forever. But as of right now, I am planning as soon as I get that yarn to start knitting this. Even if it, even if I really take my time and just do it a little bit um, each day or whatever, a little bit a week, I, I want another. And the yarn I ordered is super special. Uh, I have a picture of it. <laughs> Let me get into my iPad. Um, so I ordered, it's from this Etsy. I don't know if they also have a website. I've only seen them on Etsy. I've ordered from them once before. It's a German yarn company called Dye for Yarn, D-Y-E, like dyeing colors, like dyeing yarn, Dye for Yarn, D-Y-E-F-O-R, yarn. And they mostly do silk yarns. Um, I ordered this base once before to make the As Friends tank in black, uh, in black, 100% silk, and a fingering weight single ply, and that yarn was really sumptuous and just 
luxurious and gorgeous and beautiful. The feel of it is um, otherworldly, I would say. And also, um, there's lots of different types of silks and like some are more raw. Actually, I have some other stuff I'm showing today that is out of that more raw feeling silk. This is that very silky, shiny, satin-like silk. And even for a single ply, I could not break the fingering weight yarn single ply, I could not break with my bare hands. It would cut my skin before I could break it. So it's super strong. Um, but check out this blue. Um, this is giving Vienna. This is giving royalty in Vienna sitting in a golden gilded chamber for tea. So I will be knitting a second dapple place raglan, also full body, full sleeve, because that's what I like at the moment in this blue silk. So that's super exciting. I can't wait to receive it. Um, I have friends coming in May for a little vacation around Croatia and I would really like to be, I think, working on that during the vacation. We'll see though. I might be, I might work on two things. I might also be working on a design at the same time. We'll see. Um, okay, another recently finished object and the exact same yarn that I am wearing for this because um, especially if I'm asking for a brand to send me yarn so we can collaborate on a new design um, and the brand is in America and I'm in Europe, I always want to make sure I have more than enough and I ended up, I think this used exactly three skeins and I asked for four skeins of this color. So I had one completely untouched skein of this yarn and I was looking over yardages for look at my holes, which is like my most popular summer pattern and realized that one skein was enough to knit my size. So I knit a look at my holes the other week. I was actually working on this in Vienna and um, oh my gosh, this worked up so quickly. Uh, I feel like I knit this in about a week and I was, honestly wasn't knitting that much in Vienna. Uh, like me and Anna have been really into playing cards lately. So anytime we had downtime, we were more like playing gin rummy and chatting than I was knitting. So uh, this was just like mostly card knitting. Um, after I had the experience, because this was my first garment um, pattern where I graded the subtle shaping around the neck and the shoulders so that the back goes higher and the front dips lower. Um, after getting that design experience and really firsthand seeing how to do that, how it's done and not being so afraid of it anymore, I was like, I sat down to knit. I look at my holes and I was just gonna knit it to pattern and I was like, you know what? Adding that shaping in was so easy. And this is also lace and this is lace. And like, I know exactly how to do it and what to do. And it was so easy. I don't even think I needed to like make notes, if anything. Like I literally just like looked at the pattern, thought for a second and knew how to make that small adjustment to start with the shaping. And you can see uh, the back goes a little bit higher than the front. And I actually, am I showing the right side? Yes. I think so. Yeah, yeah, that's definitely the front. Um, I talked a little bit about it on Instagram and I asked if people would be interested in me adding to the pattern a version that starts with that shaping. And I got a lot of responses from people who were interested in that. So I don't know when, but definitely this spring, summer, I will find the time to add that to the pattern. and. I'll probably wait until I make that change to the pattern and then I'll post photos of me. I have some great photos, I'll show you a preview. Uh, I'll post photos on Instagram of me wearing this and announce that there's the new version with shaping, which it'll still be the same pattern. Like if you've bought the pattern, you can just go get the new version of it. Um, I'm still, still trying to decide exactly how I wanna do that, but I think as of right now, my plan is to just release this as version 2.0 and keep version 1.0. I want to make them separate PDFs and keep the old version on Ravelry. I don't know if I can do that on Payhip or not, but I assume that I can have two files on Payhip. I'm sure I can. Um, so that people have the option. Like some people have probably knit, look at my holes like three times and they love it and they don't, they're not aching for any improvements or to change it. Like, I don't know. I just did this little technique because I know how to do it now and I found it to be easy and it's like a slight adjustment, but I loved 
my initial look at my holes just as it was without the shaping it didn't bother me at all um so i'm sure some people would prefer to keep the old version of the pattern and maybe if they don't have it printed out or lose the file they want to be able to re-download that so as of right now that's what i'm planning on doing is just keeping both versions and then maybe i don't know maybe in a year or two after the new one comes out i might deactivate the old one i don't know we'll see how people respond to it the way people are using them um because it could also be confusing i'll put a note about it oh my gosh i'm talking so much my poor little throat is getting scratchy and dry um not much to say about this other than i knit it in the same undine yarn which is actually a thinner yarn than the pattern calls for the original pattern is in Kelburn Woolens Mojave, which I think is more close to a, like, it's like sport DK, and this is more like fingering sport. So they're pretty close, but I would definitely say this is the thinner yarn. And some, I, I think I got a question in my inbox on Instagram from someone being like, how, how, how did you just switch to the thinner yarn? Did it affect it? Did you have to change for the gauge or anything? I honestly did not even gauge swatch, nor have I measured this, but based on my measurements and the intended measurements and how this is fitting me, I'm pretty sure it's spot on. And um, the thing with gauge and with yarn weight, you can usually get gauge for a pattern with a range of yarn weights. And um, you can knit the pattern and it'll come out correctly. The only difference is that this is just going to be slightly lacier and slightly more open than a, the Kelburn Woolens Mojave would be. Uh, particularly, like, they're both going to have these large holes. I mean, it's look at my holes. But particularly, the laciness that I'm talking about is actually in the knitted part of the fabric. Like, that is just going to be slightly more lacy itself than it would be if you use a thicker yarn. Um, but I love this yarn and yeah, I think it's gonna wear really nicely for this garment. I'm just obsessed with like the most boring colors lately. I just wanna wear brown and oatmeal every day, black, um, white. That's what I like at the moment, but I will be getting that blue silk and that'll be a pop, but yeah anything else to say about this i don't think so um i also will probably just be giving the whole pattern somewhat of a second look uh if i'm gonna go through the work of like adding in this new version uh with the shaping and i think i think there are certain things that i can tweak and optimize just to make the pattern even more user-friendly easy add even more clarity this was like my second garment design that i ever did no that's not true i had several that i had this is my fourth garment design but it was still it's earlier on it was like my first year that i was designing a lot i think um of garments and yeah i'm always evolving and changing looking back i think there's some things that i would change or think could use improvement so overall i think whether you're gonna be knitting this for the first time or re-knitting it with the new version, I think you'll find this um, a nice update to the pattern. Moving on from, oh my gosh. From look at my holes. I'm getting texts on my iPad and I really can't, I need to just check. I can't help it. Okay, yeah. Um, what's next? I wanna talk about some whips and just get really real with you guys and talk about some personal failures as a girl boss. Um, I, so I really was so good. I was being such a good little girl boss, like, the past few months, I've really looked at the way I work and tried to make improvements. Um, for example, just trying to be working at two patterns at a time 
in some small way um, all the time, just so that I never find myself with nothing to do. Uh, because sometimes I do all the computer work and the math and the writing and one and a you know at one point at one time, and then I do all the knitting, and I can't knit that. I can't knit for 12 hours a day. Like my hands would be busted if I do that. So it's much better if I have, you know, a couple hours, I can work on a computer on something that is at that stage of the process and then always have something to knit too, right? So with that in mind, oh my gosh, I'm gonna sit like this just for a minute. I hope it's not ugly and inelegant, but I like to, I like to sit messed up. But I, um, Got started on a summer design in November of last year. And I was like, because I had the yarn for it, that was the other thing. Like it's not the easiest process for me to get yarns for designs here, just because it's not the same as like having access to all the collaborators I'm used to uh, in America and living in America. But I, I had yarn I brought with me, some Pearl Soho Cattail Silk that I knew I wanted to do something summery with. And I started working on that so far in advance and really slowly, just so that I always had something going on in the background. And then I was so proud of myself. I've had that pattern written since like December. And I had the sample, like the sample has been like 80% knitted for the past couple of months. And when I finished Dappled Lace Raglan, I was like, oh my gosh, I'm ready to move on to that next summer pattern in the cattail silk and I have so little work to do before I can get it out and get it into the testing phase. And so I was sitting down and knitting on it for the first time in like a couple months or something um, last week, I guess. And the whole time that I've been working on this over the months, I've sort of felt like it was a little bit big. It's a bottom up, lacy mesh um, top that is a bat wing shape, then it's gonna have a boat neck for the top. It's really simple. It's like, it's like a trapezoid or whatever. Um, it's a triangle. And um, the whole time I've been working on it, I'm, I'm, um, I'm knitting it to be modeled again by my dear friend, Anna. And she is like a size small. And I, the whole time, have been looking at it and thinking, this seems a little bit big, but I know things can sometimes just, especially lace can stretch so much in either direction, like mesh lace. I was like, this is probably just laying weird and it just needs to be on a body. It needs to be blocked and it needs to hang on the body because I like did my gauge swatch, I did my math, I was confident in everything. Let me show you, I think I have the swatch here. Yeah, I have the swatch. Here's the swatch. Can you see it? Um, it's a similar stitch to look at my holes, but pretty different at the same time. Look at my holes is like an eight row repeat and this is a four row repeat and it does not use that special decrease, but overall it, I would say it's still a similar type of mesh stitch. This is simpler to knit though, in my opinion. And um, it's gonna be so cute. Like you could wear it as a top or as a swimsuit cover up. Um, very versatile for summer. But I was just thinking it was looking too big. And finally I was like, okay, I was almost done. Uh, and I was like, let me just get out my swatch, remeasure, look at what gauge I use for this pattern in all my math. And I realized that I mismeasured this swatch and I did all of the math and all of the grading and all of the writing for my pattern based on an incorrect gauge, which I've had many points when I'm designing and knitting where I have a moment where I have that doubt where I'm like, wait, did I use the right gauge for this whole process? Because that's like step one. You cannot mess that up. If that's messed up, then everything's messed up, right? I've had scares like that, but it's never been the case. I always take out my swatch or take my sample, measure, look at what I use, look at my numbers, and I'm, it's always fine. I'm always like, okay, like, whew, everything's fine. Everything's correct. This was not fine. This is not correct. I used a gauge of 14 stitches equals four inches, and it is actually 10 stitches equals four inches. So that is like 
a difference. That means that my sample is like 25% wider than it should be. So that was a real bummer. Um, honestly, I've been working so much, so hard for the past few months and I've, I've felt really in my element. Like uh, all the releases I've had over the past few months, but especially the past two garments, actually, is it two? Yeah. Um, Best Best and Dappled Lace Raglan, I knocked those out so quickly. Like I received the yarn in the mail and sat down, swatched, Excel sheet open, Word document open, did all my math, did my grading, wrote the pattern, knit the sample, like did it so quickly and was happy with the end result. Um, and I've been feeling very powerful in my girl bossery and my work. And then I felt so powerful and happy that I have had this this batwing design just on the back burner, like ready to go at any moment. Like good for me for doing something so far in advance to make my life easier now. And then it's not a small issue. The sample is not usable and the pattern is not usable. The only way I can make the pattern usable is if I tried, <clears throat> I could try to meet the gauge that I use for the pattern because that pattern, I am confident that it is written well and written correctly for the gauge that I used, for the gauge that I used to do the math. But the only way that pattern could work is you have to get that gauge. And I thought about it for a few minutes. I was like, do I want to try to do knit some new swatches and see if I can meet that 14 stitches per four inches gauge? And no, not really. I don't want to. Um, I would still have to re-knit the sample, but it would just mean that I don't have to redo the math and rewrite the pattern if I can meet that gauge. But I went with this swatch for a reason. I like this fabric. I, this is the fabric I have in mind for the design for a, a super airy summer top or swimsuit cover up. I don't want something with much smaller holes, okay? So I like this design. I think it's cool, but definitely encountering this uh, was hitting a wall for a little bit because I've just been going, going, going so much, so fast for months and feeling so good. And then this, where I'm like, really? I need to start over on something that should have been done? It's annoying, it's demoralizing. And it kind of took the wind out of me the past like couple weeks. Um, this design is on timeout. I decided I had, an, I had another summer idea and I also already got yarn for it of something that I think I could grade, write, and knit very quickly because this is a lot of knitting. Let me show you this, <coughs> the like half finished sample. No, more than half finished sample, like 85, 90% finished sample. It's, it's difficult to really see what's going on here because I have all the stitches on the needles and I split for front and back and, and I've already knit several inches of one side and then the other side is just resting on the needles. So I don't know, you can't really see what's going on here, but it's a lot of knitting. It's very repetitive. Um, it's not something I can whip out in like a week. Um, and just, it was annoying. So I kind of like wanted to break from it. I was like, I don't want to just start from scratch on something that should have been done. I need something new. So yeah, I moved on to something else for the time being. I'm trying to decide what the plan is for this. I stand by the design and the idea. I think it'll be really cool. I think people will like it. Uh, I just don't know if I'll do it for this summer or just be super far in advance and have it ready to go next summer, but we'll see. I'm, I'm actually leaning towards still getting it done this summer because I don't have that much else already like lined up or ready to go. So I might as well get back into this. Probably better too while it is a little bit fresher in my mind of how all the numbers work and what like how the design is constructed. But yeah, it's annoying. I've never done that before. I have never graded and knit a whole pattern only to realize that my gauge is incorrect and hopefully I never do it again, but mistakes happen. Um, so I moved on to another mesh summer design. I love my mesh and y'all love my mesh. 
So this is a mesh tank top, and this uses the same stitch as Cure Mesh Pullover, for those of you who are familiar with that, which is like my fishnet skin tight, super cool, knit on lace weight yarn on giant needles. It's like no knitting at all, no yarn at all. Um, every size can be knit with one skein of the recommended yarn for that pattern. And a lot of the small sizes, you could probably knit two of them with one ball of yarn. That was with the La Vie Lame, um, Felix, I think. They're uh, lace weight wool. Um, is this the right side? No. Here's the right side. This is just the front panel. This is in progress. And I, maybe I'll call this Pure Mesh Tank. That's what I was thinking, but I'm not sure. It could also be fun to come up with a new name for it. Um, but it is just, it's pretty quick. Doesn't use a lot of yarn. Uh, it's cropped. Uh, I'm gonna have my friend Mark model this and he is muscular and beefy. So it'll look real good on him. And um, this is some yarn I got here from that shop near me that sells, uh, they sell like all like Lana Grossa, I think, yarns. It's like all they have, it's really interesting. But it'll have i cord edges on every edge, super clean. Um, but yeah, even working on this honestly has felt like a little bit of a chore, which sucks. I don't like for my knitting to feel like a chore. As I said, it is a privilege to knit and it is to be enjoyed, but it is also my job. And after my last sample going awry, I don't know, just annoying. The grading and the writing of this pattern is also feeling hectic and like disorganized, which is a bad feeling, but whatever. It'll come together, I'm sure. Um, knit flat, it'll be seamed. We love seaming, at least I do. But not much else to say about this. Luckily, it's coming together pretty quickly, which is why I shifted my focus to this, because I was like, I know this is gonna be quick to knit. Um, I also talked a little bit about um, can I sit like this? Yes, I can. Great, love that. I also talked about this silk last time, the one that I picked up in um, Berlin and then I ended up having different dye lots, which was a little bit annoying. I talked about doing like a raglan polo shirt, which I got a lot of love on that idea. People like that idea, which I'm glad y'all like it. That is something I wanna do at some point. Um, maybe even like a rugby style long sleeve polo sweater could be really cute. But for this, I have decided I don't wanna do the polo shirt um, for a few reasons. I, this, I also, I'm not sure, maybe I use this for a design in the next few months this summer, or maybe I don't have time for that and I sit on it and it'll come out when it comes out. But I went ahead and did a swatch. This is like a fingering weight yarn, maybe fingering sport. Um, but I knitted on sevens for a really airy, lovely swatch. I love a fine yarn knit at kind of a bigger gauge on bigger needles where you just get that light as air feeling. On stockinette, you know, it's not like look at my holes or like pure mesh, it's not like see-through, but it is a little bit lacy just with stockinette stitch. I find that beautiful. Uh, I don't find it like too revealing or something. Uh, but I love this this fabric and the reason I went with this fabric and also decided against the polo for this is because I only have the three skeins and I want to make sure I'm really safe. Um, the polo idea I think needs to be knit at a denser gauge for that to work beautifully and to function nicely as like a polo t-shirt, a polo shirt or, or a polo sweater. Um, and I might run out of yarn if I tried to do something at a really dense gauge on this. So yeah, I don't know when, but when I get a chance, I probably will do a simple summer tee, um, which I know there's a million of, but not by me, not with the James and Watts touch. Okay, you're gonna love it. <laughs> um, yeah, just a little update on that. What else? What else is on my list of things? to discuss. Uh, 
I've had some new patterns come out by friends, which is always exciting. I wish I had time to knit every beautiful knitwear designers, beautiful knitwear designs. I don't. I did knit that vest by Park though, and I'm patting myself on the back for that. But we just had the Helix Halter come out by Jessie Mae. And here is Park modeling the long sleeve, like, oh, the long sleeve cold shoulder moment version of that. I don't know how close I should hold this to this to the phone. But it's beautiful, it's stunning. And here is the sleeveless version. I actually was thinking about using that blue silk. Remember I was saying, if you've been watching my previous episodes, I was saying when I got that silk, I was on a high from knitting Parks design. I was like, I wanna knit more of my friend's designs. Like I can make the time for it. And then I did my taxes and I was like, oh my God, I owe so much money to the IRS. I gotta keep girl bossing. So I was like, I'm gonna turn this into something original. But what I initially wanted to knit with that blue silk is, um, Jesse has, and I don't know if this is secret or not, whatever. <laughs> it doesn't matter. Um, Cats out of the bag, Jesse's doing a, a pullover sweater in this stitch texture and this lace. I think it's the same lace. And I wanted to knit that. Um, that's gonna be beautiful. If, if, if I'm officially announcing that design, you're welcome. It's gonna be really fun and nice and everyone's gonna love it. But, yeah, I probably won't get around to that yet. Maybe one day I'll knit it. Um, but super exciting for her for that beautiful warm weather release. And then Jacqueline Seaslack just came out with the Moon Crush Pullover, which is this beautiful Intarsia three color um, pullover. Why did I almost want to call it a jumper? Ew. I don't, we don't say jumper where I come from. That is the in evil global influence of the Slipover lobby. Oh my God, thank you to all the people in my comments who were like, no, I'm with you, it's a vest. Um, I had one person comment that in Germany it's a Pulanda, which I found out because I was in Germany and my friend was like, I was telling him about my vest because it was coming out right when I got home from Germany, it was the week I released Best Vest. And he was like, you call it a vest? I was like, yes I do. And he was like, oh, it's a Pulanda. And he was like, a vest is something else in German. So anyway, this is, the Moon Crush pullover, which I will go ahead and J Jackie has credited me many times, but I will go ahead and credit myself now again on my own YouTube TV show that I came up with the name Moon Crush for her tank top that came out last summer. Um, she like was asking for name suggestions and I came up with that easily and quickly. I wish I could always come up with a name that easily for my own stuff. Anyway, beautiful new design, congrats to her. She also has a, a version of this that does not have Intarsia. It does use multiple colors, but it's like uh, one, I think it's like the body and one sleeve or one color, and then you have like a pop of color sleeve for the other sleeve. And that's the Moonless. I think it's called the Moonless pullover. She's the same for the tank. She's the Moon Crush tank, and then the Moonless tank, and the Moon Crush pullover, and the Moonless pullover. So congrats to my lovely friends on their beautiful, designs. Um, speaking of naming designs, I got the funniest texts from my sister the other day. She was hanging out with my parents and overall my family is very supportive of me and my, my work and my designs and my art, but I know that not everything I do is to everyone's taste and that also extends to my family. And I know my mom is sometimes like, oh my God, at like all of these skin tight, super revealing, slutty summer patterns that I love to design. She never says it to my face, but I hear that the family grapevine that she's like, oh my God, James keeps coming out with uh, sweaters where his nipples are out and like his whole body is showing, which she would never wear that. So I understand that she's like, oh my God, but it doesn't bother me uh, at all. Uh, in fact, it has gave, given me some lovely entertainment over the past week. I got texts from my sister saying they were hanging out and I guess I was the topic of conversation and my new designs coming out. And my mom 
She also, I know, my sister told me that she thinks the name Look At My Holes is like abhorrent, which that's the point. It is so funny to name a sweater something so silly and like a little bit raunchy. Um, all the time I see posts on Instagram where I can tell people are a little bit embarrassed and they're, t they're having a laugh at the name, but they have to, you know, they, people want to knit it because it's a cute pattern and then they have to pay the price of knitting it to have to tell people what it's called. And people often will say, here's my new FO of the week, it's called dot dot dot, look at my holes, and they have a bunch of laughing emojis because they can't believe they even have to say that. And that is the point. It is so funny to get um, all people saying look at my holes, but I especially enjoy making old women say it. Sorry, it, it cracks me up. And I hope it cracks them up too. And if, if you find the name so disgusting and offensive that you can't bear to knit it, then don't knit it. Then it's not the pattern for you. Sorry about it. Um, <laughs> I'm doing just fine with me and my look at my holes girlies army, okay? Um, we love that pattern and we love that name. And then making, that was a collaboration with Jessie Mae. She made a design for a tank top that you can wear underneath as a layered knitwear moment. And she named her tank top as friends. So it can be look at my holes as friends, like just as friends, like not as lovers, right? It is so funny. It's so stupid. Oh, it makes me laugh. <sighs> Back to what I said. I do not take myself, my job, this life, anything too seriously. Okay. And I, for me, it makes me happy to live life that way. But... Oh, let me get to the point of this. My sister texted me, they were hanging out, talking about me and my new designs. And my mom, being a jokester, was like, I've got some new names he could use for designs. How about Nipple City? How about Nipples on the Beach? I feel like there was one more. Let me see, Can, is this, do I have that text? Nipples on display was the other one. And it cracks me up so much that I'm almost like, I think I should design something called Nipple City or Nipples on the Beach. But also, I don't know, maybe that's going into territory that's just too much, but I don't think so. But also there's the element of like, not everyone is allowed to put their nipples on display on Instagram or on the beach or on the street and there's some inequality there. And I don't know if I'm highlighting that in the right way, if I name my pattern nipples on display and not everyone has the right to put their nipples on display. It's a real shame. Free the nipple, okay? Like it's just a nipple. However, I say that, but I need to, I need to tell y'all something. I have an admission of guilt. I, one of the photos I took of me in this sweater has my nipple sticking out like that. Hopefully you can't see it. I just made it do that. But my nipple is sticking directly out of the hole on the eyelet of my lace, which like, okay, I'm wearing a lacy sweater with nothing underneath. My nipples will show. I don't care. I don't mind that. But the way it was showing in this photo, I also edited the photo a little bit uh, to bring out some of the more rosy tones in our skin and in our surroundings. So I was upping like the reds and the pinks in editing. And that made my nipple bright pink and poke out of the lace. And I went onto Facetune and removed my nipple from the photo. And then uh, because this is a collab with Ritual Dyes, I emailed her the photos for, you know, publication, advertising, posting, talking about the designs, she can use them too. And I emailed her the unedited one. I emailed her the wrong one where my nipple was showing and I actually still haven't. I need to email her back and be like, hey, listen, I meant to send you this nipple photo. Which like normally I wouldn't care, but like I said, with the editing, it just looks, it's way too nipply. Um, Hold on, I have the photo. I'll show you the unedited photo, but I will not be posting it on Instagram. No, wait, I don't have, I don't have it. False alarm. I don't have it on my iPad, it's on my phone. So, but 
I took a video of me face tuning the nipple out and I showed some friends and they were like, you've got to post this on Instagram because it's funny. And I probably will on release day to just for full disclosure, I edited the nipple out of this photo. <laughs> um, what else? Okay. I think I am good on knitting talk. Um, yeah, I think we can move on from knitting and start to wrap things up, talk a little bit about a few other aspects of life. This video has got to be an hour and a half, if not two hours. I'm scared. I'm scared to upload this. I took, I took this video in 4K, which I'm probably going to regret. I regretted it last time because it took forever to upload, but it's nice to have the full quality. I didn't even realize the iPhone video can, you just got to press a little button in the corner and you take 4K video. I didn't know that. Now I do. But that also means that the video size is just enormous. And I had a hard time uploading it last time. But um, let's talk about video games and gaming. I last time was playing a little bit of Final Fantasy X. I have jumped back off the Final Fantasy X shit. I was playing consistently a little bit every night for like a week or two. Uh, but have found myself going back to what I was talking about in my first episode, which was playing Zelda Minish Cap, which was a Game Boy Advance game that they've now released on Nintendo Switch on the little Game Boy Advance emulator that you can download on, on Nintendo Switch. I'm not sure if you can download it for free or if it, I think you need to have some type of membership to the online system for Switch, which is annoying, but I use, I use the online gaming stuff so I'm always gonna have that membership, it's worth it to me. And then I get, you get some free perks, like you get a Super Nintendo and regular Nintendo, like a, I think there's Sega Genesis. Right now, they, the most recent ones they've added, they added N64 last year, and now they've added just recently Game Boy Advance and regular Game Boy emulators. For the new ones that they've added, for the Game Boy Advance and Game Boy, there's really not a lot of games. There's like six games to play, and that's kind of lame. Like, really, what would it cost them? They are Nintendo. What would it cost them to put, like, 100 games? They, they, they wouldn't take up a lot of space or anything. Anyway. But I've been back on Minish Cap, which is really cute and really fun and not too hard at all. Uh, nice little puzzles um, that are pretty easy to figure out, but scratch your brain just enough. Cute music, cute gameplay and animation. I love it all. Um, cute graphics. Cute art. That being said, the new Zelda game for Switch, uh, what's it called? I think it's called like Zelda Tears of the Kingdom or something. Um, that comes out in just a few days. That comes out in like early May. And that comes out when my friends are visiting me and we're all gamer girls and we probably will all, I think they're bringing their Switches and we will probably all download and play it when we're like, we're gonna be spending all our days like on the beach, on, on the coast, uh, and then winding down in the Airbnb, playing Zelda together. It sounds like a dream come true. I'm really excited. As soon as that game comes out, I'll probably drop other games that I'm playing and play the new Zelda because um, Breath of the Wild, the original Nintendo Switch title for Zelda is a glorious game, super fun. Uh, we all played it, we all loved it, and this is, just a sequel to that. I think it's even based in the same world. I'm sure it's gonna be a lot of familiar faces, familiar mechanics. I know this game has, I think, more of an element of flight and like uh, Sky Kingdom and air travel. So that, that'll that be, I'm sure, really satisfying. Um, but all you gamer girlies, let me know what you're playing and if you're gonna play the new Zelda, if you're excited about it as I am. Um, that's gaming. Um, I also have gotten back into anime for the first time in a few years. I've been an anime fan since I was a, a little kid, uh, starting with Cardcaptor Sakura. That was my first big anime obsession as an elementary schooler, because it, it came on regular TV where I lived and I never had cable. Um, so a lot of other popular, uh, like late nineties, early two thousands anime that you could watch on TV, I did not have access to. Like, uh, Sailor Moon was, uh, at least where I live, it was only on cable channels, which I didn't have. 
So I don't have that nostalgic attachment to Sailor Moon. I'm sure I would. If I grew up with it, I think I would have loved it as a little gay boy. But Cardcaptor Sakura was my gem. And I've been into anime ever since off and on. But the past, I've had like a Crunchyroll membership constantly for years, but I have not really been using it or watching anything much at all for the past year and a half, two years. And I always want to be watching anime and it just is about like really getting into it and wanting like enjoying it properly and having the habit. And then once I get into it, a lot of times it's like a switch. If I'm into anime, I'm not into any other TV. And if I'm into other TV, I'm not into anime. Right now, I'm more into anime, actually. I'm not watching uh, Real Housewives so much the past week. I'm more watching anime. But when, when I haven't watched for like two years, it feels like a lot to catch up on. I do kind of keep a profile on my anime list. <laughs> I don't know if anyone's interested in that, but I could like share it in a comment or in the description or something. You can see things I've watched over the years and ratings and things that I've completed or are in progress or gave up on. It's really dorky to have on my anime list, but I forget things. The moment I am done watching something, I forget all about it. So I like that element of organization, keeping a list of titles I've watched. It's not up to date though. I'm sure I watched a few things in the past three years and not everything has ended up on my, my anime list. But I always, when I wanna get back into anime, I always check because you can look at rankings of what people are loving on that website. And I couldn't really decide, so I just decided to pick up on something that I started um, a long time ago and now there's new episodes of. So I watched the first season of Demon Slayer as it was airing and really loved it. And then kind of fell out of anime and there's been an entire second season and a movie. And I think the third season might be airing. I'm not sure about that. But there's definitely a whole second season I haven't watched. So I've been working my way through season two of Demon Slayer. I'm enjoying it, it's nice. So far, it's not as captivating as season one was, but that is often the case. First seasons are often really strong because it's a lot of world building and it's really exciting. And then there's less, of, there's less novelty once you already understand the world and it's just a continuation of the plot. But still, an exciting, uh, like, demonic martial arts fight scene battle anime. Um, if you were in anime and you're loving something recently, I especially like, I'll take any recommendations, but generally when I'm getting into the spirit of enjoying anime, I more gravitate towards current things. I like to watch things that are like for the past few years or even better currently airing things. Uh, oh, I watched one thing that was airing within the past year. I watched the whole first season, I think. Did I finish it? I think I finished the whole first season of uh, Spy Family, Spy X Family, something like that, which was a really popular one. And it, like, I think it was like last summer it was airing, maybe, or spring. I don't know. Uh, that was a fun one though. Um, that's what I'm watching. Um, at the gym, still going, still loving it. My routine's changing a little bit. I've been doing a lot less aerobic exercise and cardio and more just focusing on strength training and weightlifting. I had a helpful comment from someone on my last video because I was talking about knee pain and they were like, you should add in an entire day of like core exercise. And I probably won't do a whole day of core exercise with the way I'm, I'm organizing my workouts these days because I do core exercise every time I go to the gym. Um, my buddy Mark, who's been helping train me, the first time we worked out together, he asked me to do uh, like a sit up and I couldn't do a single sit up. And he, he was like trying not to freak me out, but he was literally scared. He was like, I can't believe you can't do a sit up. He was like, okay, we've got to fix your core. And he told me he was like, he gave me some simpler like uh, crunches and other simpler, easier core exercises I could do and was like, do these every single day without fail. Um, and I've kept up that habit and now my core is so strong. I, within about a month of going to the gym, I could do sit-ups, regular sit-ups. And now what I do almost every time I go to the gym is I do sit-ups on a very steep um, decline, right? 
um, where my feet are much higher than my head. So I have a much wider range of motion rather than going from here to here. I'm going from here all the way to here, right? Um, so not only am I doing sit-ups on a deep decline, but I also am holding a 10 kilogram plate on my chest and doing a chest press on every sit-up. And I really enjoy that. It's just been, it's been one of the areas of my strength and my fitness that is so easy to see a, a, a ridiculous amount of progress in a pretty short amount of time. I started going to the gym in November and I've kept it up ever since. It's now late April and I, um, yeah, it's just incredible to go from, okay, I can't even do one sit up to I do 50 sit-ups on a deep decline with weights on my chest. That's really fun. So I do core all the time and I agree. The person who commented that was like, it makes your whole body feel more strong and balanced and supportive and that is so true and that's why I do it. Um, before I started uh, going to the gym, the past few years, I've been dealing with more and more back pain and back problems and I even threw my back out twice uh the past couple years so badly where i like couldn't really walk and my back feels great i have to say i do not have any back pain at the moment and uh i shouldn't like it was stressful to be like oh my god i'm only like 20 28 and i'm having throwing out my back twice in one year to the point where i can't walk like what is my future gonna look like like I, mobility is something I value and that is important to me. I think most people do. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I didn't start going to the gym to address back pain, but it just was an amazing um, side effect of working out and increasing my core strength. And I'm just, I'm enjoying all the benefits of it. I'm enjoying the process. Um, my goals, so I could not do, I could not do a sit-up or a push-up, and now I can do sit-ups and push-ups. The push-ups are still uh, slow going. Like I can't, they really tire me out. I can't do a ton. Uh, but if I put it earlier in my workout before I'm too tired, I will often do like five sets of five push-ups. So 25 total, uh, which is amazing before I, I could not do one. And my form is still not perfect, but it's getting there. It's getting to the point of a real proper push-up where my chest is getting all the way to the ground. I'm using a wider grip, which is a little easier, and I would like, as I improve and get stronger, to um, be able to do a narrower grip. There's all sorts of different hand placements you can use for push-ups. They all engage your body and work your muscles differently. Um, I wanna be able to utilize all of them for whatever I wanna work on in a given day. Um, but for now, I'm kind of stuck on the wide grip, and that's fine. But long-term goals, I wanna be able to do a pull-up. And I would really love to be able to do a pull up within one year of starting uh, training. Uh, even less than a year would be great because I'm only in Croatia until through October probably. And I would love to accomplish it before I leave Croatia. I would love for my friend Mark who's training me and helping me immensely. Like I could not, I would not have had this physical and strength transformation without his guidance because he is a gym bro. He's been going to the gym for seven, eight years. He's been super supportive, giving me so much of his time, helping train me, giving me all his knowledge, helping me with my form, um, just generally making me feel good about myself and feel confident in an environment where I feel really insecure and I feel really small. I feel like I don't belong and feel like I'm doing something I'm not meant to be doing. It's been invaluable to have such a supportive friend walking me through this journey. So I would love to be able to get a pull up and to show him a pull up before I leave. And that is the plan, that's what I'm working towards. And I think I'm gonna do it, we'll see. If I don't, I don't, but I think, I, I think it's reasonable to get it within a year. And before that, I've gotten my sit-ups, I've gotten my push-ups, I'd like to be able to get dips where you like go on a piece of equipment that has bars and you you pretty much press your, your whole body weight. Your body's in the, your, your feet are off the ground and you bend at the, the elbows and straighten and like, that's a dip. And I think that's what it's called. I think that is more reasonable that I get that first and then I'll be even closer to getting a pull up. 
So that is my gym update for those of you who enjoy the exercise talk. And um, what else? Oh, I have one other um, piece of knitting related content. I like want to just sometimes talk about like random things that I want or like products, things that I don't need but I would like. Actually, a couple I can think about. Maybe I'll only talk about one today, but I really want the Like. Leica, I don't know. Everyone who talks about this brand on YouTube always does the exact same thing. We all like don't know how to pronounce it and say it three different ways, but y'all know what I'm talking about. L-Y-K-K-E, uh, the Leike brand that makes knitting needles and crochet hooks. Um, they got really popular a few years ago. Uh, I think they started with their driftwood. They're like petrified, like driftwood, something like that, knitting needles in, these, in this beautiful color. Uh, very beautiful, like, grayy, neutrally warm color. And they've since continued to grow in popularity and come out with a bunch of other products in different colors and different materials. And they have done, I think it's been out for a couple of years. So it's not like something new, but I haven't ever tried it. I've just heard about it. But they have a knitting needle set that is um, copper. I think it's, I don't know if they're like solid copper or copper plated. Um, but either way, they're beautiful. I love copper and they're expensive. I don't remember how much, but there are more than uh, the knitting needles I use cost. And um, yeah, I only bring them up to say that I think they're beautiful and I want them, but I don't really need them. And I don't have tons of spare spending money at the moment. Thank you, IRS. So I don't have any plans to get them. Maybe, maybe a Leica rep is watching my YouTube video, or maybe someone knows a Leica rep and you want to go be like, hey, you know, James and Watts really wants to try your copper needles. Here's the other thing though. Okay, I think they would be beautiful and I think they'd be no problem at all, but I'm like, what if I'm allergic? Because I definitely have a nickel allergy. I was Googling it though, and the percentage of people, like a nickel allergy is so common. A huge percentage of people have allergies to nickel. And I have found out the hard way by getting horrible, painful, burning rashes from belt buckles and also cheap glasses that contain nickel uh, fucked me up. And I have to be careful about that. So now I'm like, okay, what if I have a like copper allergy? But I Googled it and very few people have a copper allergy. So I, I don't think that's something really to worry about as long as there's not nickel and the copper, because there can also be like alloys and stuff of mixtures of metals. Um, but just imagine the patina that those needles would get if you use them a lot for years. Like, I don't know if they would like turn green or what, but it wouldn't, I wouldn't mind if they turned green. I think that's beautiful. Like I love a nasty old penny that like a cop, like an US copper penny that has turned green. It's beautiful. Um, so yeah, I. I would at some point would like those needles. I don't know if they sell individuals. I think they sell individual interchangeables. I don't know if they sell individual fixed in the coppers, but that might be fun to just order one size fixed, see how I like it. Um, Cause the other thing is I am a Knitter's Pride loyalist because Knitter's Pride has so many different interchangeable sets. I'm also an interchangeable needle user overall, unless I'm using very large or very small needle sizes. Everything from like a size US 4 through like a 12, I'm using interchangeables. I have three sets, they're all Knitter's Pride. I have the Royals, which have the uh, colored bamboo, I think it's bamboo, and all these like really beautiful different colors um, for the body of the needle. And then they have uh, metal, really nice slick metal tips. I think they're aluminum. Uh, they're super slick. And then I have, the Nova Platinas, which I feel like no one talks about, but they are pointier and all metal. I, I really like metal needles more than anything. Uh, and that's a very slick, slippery metal, which I like. I like to get some speed going, um, especially if I'm just knitting stock net or something, uh, or lace. Nice to have those sharp points. So I have the Nova Platinas. And all of these come in like different versions. There's like deluxe versions with like longer needles. And then there's like 
short versions that you can use on a with a smaller cable so you can get circumference to do a 16 inch circumference uh, on an interchangeable um, and that once I realized that I then bought a third set because you can also just never have too many needles like I often will have a project that gets abandoned for a year and I don't the nice thing about interchangeables is that you can take off the needle and put on stoppers if you do need those needles but if I can avoid having to do that and spend my time taking off needles and putting on stoppers and making a note of like, okay, this project uses this needle, so when I come back to it, I need to take the stoppers off and put the needles back on. I need to know what size to use. Oh my God, if any of you are watching on two times speed, good luck understanding what I just said. That was too much. But I, <laughs> after speaking so quickly, I'm now gonna speak so slowly. I, don't know what I was saying. All of this to say, oh, I was saying that I have my third set from Knitter's Pride are the Zings, which is also a metal needle, uh, but they have different colors, whereas the Novotinas are all silver. Um, the, no the Zings come in different colors for each size, and I got the short set so that I could, if need be, do a 16 inch circular and like knit a hat on my interchangeables. The needle tips are not quite as short as my fixed 16 inch circulars because that is one size. The 16 inch, I have a lot of fixed needles because I didn't have that interchangeable set beforehand and I needed to knit hats. And I think I prefer my fixed ones because the needle tips are even shorter. Um, they're not so short that you can't hold on. Like I do not like the nine inch circulars for like sock knitting where you have to just like hold on like with two fingers and bleh, don't like that at all not enjoyable for me <laughs> it's not a privilege to knit on those for me <laughs> um but all this to say i'm very invested in the knitters pride ecosystem uh the needles compared to a lot of other brands like addies and high Hayas and uh chiagus those are the big brands that come to mind and like they're much more inexpensive than those brands. And I think the quality overall is pretty good, especially for the price. And then especially the cables, the interchangeable cables are really cheap, like a couple bucks for a, a new cable, or like you can buy like on like Amazon or knitting websites or whatever, you can buy multi-packs for pretty cheap if you wanna get a whole bunch of them, which it's so nice when I have three needle sets to just have an abundance of cables in different lengths. So I never have to really worry about running out. And if I'm gonna get a Lika set, that is entering a whole new species into my kingdom, into my ecosystem of Knitter's Pride. And that is annoying. So it's something to think about because I'm gonna have to keep that organized, keep things maybe a little bit separate, just make sure I'm careful I don't know how much extra cables and extra needles cost for those, but I would assume it's more than Knitter's Pride, and I don't want to be losing any of that, right? But I don't know. The copper is so pretty that I want it. But also, uh, I wouldn't be that mad if Knitter's Pride just does a ripoff. <laughs> I mean, Lika doesn't own copper, okay? Other brands can come out with a copper set, okay? Just because they did it first, it's all, it's all right, you know? Um, <laughs> if Knitter's Pride wants to go out with a copper needle set, I'll buy it in a heartbeat. Um, I have on my list that I maybe wanted to talk about film photography, but um, I feel like I've been talking for a long, long time. It was a little bit light outside when I started and it's now pitch black, so hopefully you have enjoyed getting to see the light change. We are just using my overhead light. I hope it's not too dim or too ugly. Um, but uh, I will not get into film photography. For those of you who follow me on Instagram, you're probably aware that I'm into it. And most of my pattern photos that I've been doing the past couple years, I have done with film cameras. I got into film in high school, but then kind of got out of the, the hobby through my 20s and now I've gotten heavily back into it, especially that I can use it in a really creative way for my business has been really enjoyable. And it's a super cool hobby. I'm always happy to get people into it. I think people are interested by it when I discuss it a little bit on Instagram. So to save time, I'm not gonna get into it too much, but if any of you watching this 
want to hear more about it or what specifics, oh my gosh, I could do, I could do a whole two or three hour video talking about my experience with film and giving you pointers as a total amateur of what I think is helpful to know and giving some direction for you to get into film. I don't know if I'll actually do that. I could do that. But if you want to pop in a few questions or just tell me generally that you're interested in hearing about the film, then I'll try to leave more time to talk about it next time. Um, like I said, I don't know if I'll do a whole video about it, but little by little, I could talk about it a little bit every time if people are really interested in knowing about that topic, but I'll save it. Um, people are loving that I am doing the flowers, so I'm going to keep that up. These are carnations and, um, I wouldn't normally go for yellow and orange carnations. I love green carnations when I can find them. I can almost always find the green ones at the grocery store in, in the US, um, at least where I've lived. Here, I have found green carnations once or twice and they kind of weren't cheap for carnations, but I got them anyway because they're green. I wouldn't normally go for this yellow orange, but I was with Anna and she recommended them. She said she loved them and like got compliments on them in her home. So I was like, okay, let's do it. And they're beautiful. But the thing I like about carnations is that generally they are a cheaper flower. Like flowers are a luxury to be spending money on something that just looks pretty in your home and dies quickly. But that's the other thing, carnations last forever. Oh my gosh. A lot of times the stems will like get moldy from sitting in water before the blossoms even look shitty, before they look dead and you throw them out at that point, but that takes a long time. That's like two to three weeks of sitting in water. Uh, whereas like a lot of other flowers, roses and tulips are like one week, one week and you gotta throw them out. So I love carnations for that reason. I like kind of grew up thinking and being told that carnations were not a nice flower because they're inexpensive and they're basic and they're common, but they're beautiful. They're beautiful and they have a lot of virtues, okay? I love that. that that's the main things for me. They're beautiful, they're inexpensive, and they last forever. So I really recommend them. And you can get them in a lot of cool colors. Um, so that's the flowers of the week. I also, uh, I, I like took a break from painting my nails for a while, but I think, I don't know if my nails were painted on the first podcast episode or not, but I've been back into painting my nails and keeping them painted these days. And I got this uh, new color at a, uh, like a drugstore pretty much drugstore equivalent here and uh this is the color i'm wearing it's a metallic reflective uh it's like a really it's like a goldy toned just neutral though it like matches perfectly with what i like to wear these days all my like soft oatmeal colored clothing that i wear so i've been this is my like third application of this nail color and i will probably keep doing it and i i have the polish here to show you. It's by Catrice. Do we have that in the US? I don't know, probably, I don't know, but it's easy to find here and it's really inexpensive. Um, it's the Catrice Brave Metallics Nail Polish in the colorway, every day I'm sparkling. <laughs> um, it says New York. It says Frankfurt, New York, London. So I guess we do have it. Um, made in Luxembourg though, wow, fancy. Um, here, here's the unit carton, can you see it? Yeah, uh, I find this super, super easy to apply really well for me, because I'm not that good at doing my own nails, um, but I can do really decently with this. Uh, the formula is very opaque and easy, and then the main thing is that the brush on this is like a nice, paddle that is so like nail shaped it is really easy especially on like the smaller nails like uh, pretty much everything except the thumb i can kind of just get enough product on there and press down to the point where i am almost covering my whole nail with one swipe and then maybe one a second swipe just to hit if i missed a millimeter on the edge for like the slightly bigger fingers but the pinky one swipe um yeah that's my nail polish Oh my gosh, I can't believe I talked so much for so long. Oh. This was too much. Okay, I hope y'all like it. And if you don't, go to hell. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> okay.
okay thanks for watching uh keep keep your eyes on my instagram this week james and watts for the release information for dapple place raglan take advantage of the, the pattern sale 22 percent off all my patterns with the code that'll be publicized on instagram um buy all my patterns knit all my patterns enjoy them love your knitting it's a privilege to pearl love you you're so nice thank you for your loyalty love you bye kiss kiss bye